Let's do this as a worked example. In the forward pass, in the forward pass, we need to store the primals. So we start with x1 and x2. Uh, so let me use one color here for the forward pass. Let's say green is for the forward pass. Um, so here, this would just be x1 and x2. Um, and we have concrete values. So x1 in the paper is set to 2, and x2 is set to 5. Um, so we have here a value of, I can also really write 2 and 5. Um, then we multiply the, them. So in this node here, I would get 10. Uh, in this node here, I would get the sine of 5. Um, here I would get uh, the ln of 2. And here I get the ln of 2 plus 10, and so on and so on. So I really get concrete numbers out. And uh, here, if I look up at the table, so the end result here will be 11.6525. Now, for the backward pass, we are essentially expressing our chain rule as paths in this graph. And uh, we want to evaluate all of these paths simultaneously. So what, what is f uh, in the first place? Um, I'm using different color here for backward. Uh, let's say f here was uh, ln x1 plus x1 times x2 minus the sine of x2. Now, we have uh, this operation here, which uh, asks, what is the derivative of this lengthy expression with regard to the first, OK, I'm, I'm writing it down explicitly. So now I'm asking, what's the derivative with respect to d ln x1 plus x1, x2? And down there, I'm asking, what's the derivative with regard to that? Yeah, because this, this was the, what we're looking at, what happens in the node V5 is that we're taking this difference here. And now we're asking what's the derivative with respect to the first summand and then with respect to the second summand. And um, so, well, the answer here would be plus one. And the answer there would be minus one. And uh, these are now going to be stored and propagated on the backward pass. Now, so let's look in our table here. Um, this uh, V4 bar, so in, in the words of the table, this would be V4 bar. This was uh, dv5 by dv4. And this was the plus one that we just found. On the other hand, V3 bar here involved this minus one that we just found. And uh, they're also multiplying with this V5 bar, but nothing interesting happened there. Yeah, V5 bar was the output, so the derivative of that with, re with respect to itself was just plus one. Yeah. So, um, so far, um, we are sending plus 1 times minus 1, and we're storing that result. And we're sending plus 1 times plus 1, and we're storing that result. OK, now this goes on. Um, for example, here, uh, we're asking for the derivative of sine x2 
with respect to X2. Um, evaluated at X2 equals 5. So that's the uh, that would be the uh, cosine of 5. But if we come from uh, the very right hand side, then we multiply this with all the terms that we found before. Uh, in particular, we're uh, multiplying this with uh, V3 bar, and uh, V3 bar had been minus 1. So we are associating a term with each of these arrows, and then we are multiplying uh, all of them as we work our way from right to left in this graph. All right, so um, sometimes these um, numbers that we get are very simple ones, because here if we just uh, add up two terms, well, the derivative with regard to, let's say, the first sum is just plus one, regardless of what were the concrete values. But sometimes we need the concrete values. Yeah? So here, if we uh, want to do that one, then we will need to know that it had been evaluated at two. Okay? And you can go through this uh, table, uh, or do it by yourself and verify your, your results in terms of this uh, table in more detail. And then uh, what's found at the very end is that the here the partial derivative of my output df with respect to uh, x1 was 5.5, and df with respect to x2 had been 1.7. So if we now do um, gradient descent, um, we will update uh, we will update uh, x1 more strongly than we will update x2 because it had a larger gradient. So I said there's this forward mode and there's this uh, reverse mode of uh, auto differentiation. Uh, both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, the perfect setting for reverse mode is if we have many inputs. And when I say inputs, uh, these could be measurements, but they can also be parameters. Um, so we have many inputs and at the end, uh, ideally, just a single output. Because then we will uh, propagate this inf information from the output uh, in the breadth first sense all the way to the input. And then we found all partial derivatives of the output with respect to the inputs simultaneously. Um, the, the downside is that we always need to store these activations as we go forward. Uh, so for extremely deep networks, this could become a problem, that you need to store all these intermediate activations. All right, and there are, then there are also mixed forms. Um, if you think of it in terms of uh, multiplying Jacobians, then uh, you can have a uh, smart choice of which uh, terms you want to multiply first. Um, and which ones you want to multiply later, uh, because um, you know sometimes if you do it in a dumb way, then this uh, you will get uh, if you multiply some of these Jacobians with each other, you get a huge tensor. If you do it in a smart way, um, then you will just uh, keep doing matrix vector multiplications, and uh, finding this optimal sequence of which Jacobians do you want to multiply first. Uh, that in itself is an NP-hard problem. Um, but now, when beforehand, or if you don't want to solve this optimization problem, typically you, re you revert to the one or the other strategy, so forward or reverse automatic differentiation. 
and all the deep learning networks that people commonly use have this reverse mode automatic differentiation built in, known in that community as backpropagation. Okay, so we store on the forward pass the intermediate results. We use these intermediate results and the recipes or the knowledge associated with each node of how did that node depend on its input. Uh, we use that to propagate information from the output back to the inputs. And uh, the inputs that we usually care about in a neural network are not the measurements, but the parameters. Yeah, so if you remember that this is the uh, loss function, then typically the uh, measurements are just given. There's nothing we can do about them, but the parameters is what we want to optimize over in order to find a neural network that overall has a lower loss. Good. Any questions for this? Um, because we have, um, so in, in abstract, okay, let me move, let me move to last week. So the question was why do we want to differentiate with respect to the parameters? Um, here I had last week, there was this extremely simple example. There was a one dimensional training set and uh, we defined some loss function and we had just one parameter to optimize over namely how far or where do we want to split? And then we found uh, loss functions. Now, depending on which loss function we chose, uh, for example, there was uh, this loss function here. And well, usually now we have uh, not one parameter, but millions of parameters. Um, we know that we have some loss, so maybe in parameter space, maybe we are at this point, and we want to know how can I change my network so as to give me better predictions as measured by the loss function. So I, uh, what I can do locally is evaluate the gradient, the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters, and then I find out that it's actually a good idea to uh, take a step to the left. I will update my parameters, um, we'll get the gradient again and keep doing that tens of thousands of times until hopefully I end up with a really low loss. Okay. More questions? And nowadays, we solve pretty impressive optimization problem, literally millions and millions of parameters. And then if, if we're lucky, tens of thousands of training examples. Huh? And then you want to find in this extremely high dimensional uh, space, millions of parameters, you're trying to find a good local optimum. All right. Um, now I have a question to you. Um, we, um, so I wanted to continue with convolutional neural networks now. Um, we can either do this quickly and then we're done with neural networks in 25 minutes for this semester. Um, or I could go a bit slower and give you more details and also still devote uh, next week to, uh, or let's say another two hours, uh, devote Wednesday also to discussing more details of specific architectures and so on. Um, who would like to move on away from the networks to graphical models? What is the next topic? Uh, yeah. Um, so what I want to do for sure is to um, did I give a list of the topics anywhere? No. On the website. On the website. All right, um, good, show you my internal. So um, we are here and 
what I will for sure is uh, direct the probabilistic graphical models, which will take us a few hours. And uh, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, this graph-based semi-supervised learning. We don't really absolutely need to do two hours on that. Um, this, I guess, we could omit. So, I mean, if we do more neural network, we lose something else, for sure. <laughs> All right. Um, so, who would like to have another two hours beyond today with more details on neural networks? Okay, I think that counts as a majority. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, then I go uh, leisurely and... Um, will not rush for the rest of today. Good. So I want to talk about some of the design choices. In neural network training. So let me give again the big formula of how to train a neural network. <coughs> so we said we want to minimize over the parameters some loss function. This loss function depended on the ground truth targets, TI, and our predictions. The predictions itself depended on the, the measurements that we had as input, but also crucially on the parameters. And previously I talked about a regularizer. I can also write it down explicitly. I say we have a regularizer in addition. Okay, so this is... Um, you know, if, if somebody asks you what training of a neural network is, you know, this is always a correct answer, okay? Um, unfortunately, it's also a very generic answer. So <clears throat> let's highlight some of the uh, choices here. There is the regularizer. Um, sometimes explicit regularizers are being used. Um, so, for example, uh, as in rich regression, we could say we have some parameter times um, the squared norm, or we could use a lasso regularizer. We could say um, we penalize the L1 norm of the coefficients. But sometimes uh, also, optimization and normalization strategies are used that turn out to have a regularizing effect, even though it's not, you know, completely obvious why actually they have a regularizing effect. Then there is the architecture. And there is so much to say about the architecture, you know, thousands of papers. Um, and so there's the question of which architecture is better, you know, in expectation or on average. And there's always the question, well, but which architecture is best for the amount of trading data that I have? So architecture, and we'll talk more about that today and, and on Wednesday. Then there is the choice of the loss function. Um, Manuel already hinted. At first, there's a big distinction between uh, loss functions, let's say, for classification on for regression problems. Um, typical choice for a classification uh, problem would be cross entropy. But sometimes, uh, let's say, if you have a strong class imbalance, uh, you want to use other things like uh, Sjöhorns and Dice loss, maybe. For regression, you can just use the squared norm that we've minimizing in regression all this time, 
or maybe robust uh, version thereof. Um, or you could have uh, a structured loss function that takes into account the neural network plus possible post-processing. Or you could uh, devise an adversarial architecture to give you a loss, many, many choices. Then, well, implicit in this summation here was the training set. Of course, you know, oftentimes you are given whatever you're given, yeah? and this is your training set. But then, uh, often it is too small, and then you need to use tricks to uh, somehow get more out of it, like uh, data augmentation, or you can perhaps simulate your own data. For example, um, uh, Grant, you know, there are these video games, all these video engines. Um, they are quite popular nowadays for generating ground truth, um, like this grand theft auto or something. Um, so then you get computers that are really good at navigating, uh, you know, the east side of LA, and uh, less good at navigating other environments. Um, and here, you know, I beautifully wrote argmin, but you know, how how do you do that? So. Uh, there's the optimization strategy itself. Let's say stochastic gradient descent. Okay, but with stochastic gradient descent, you know what step size are going to use? Uh, a typical choice for step size would be something called Adam. But then there's the question. So step size. But there's the question of all right. But how do we initialize? What what's a good random initialization of my parameters? Sorry, it's too small to read. Uh, so I wrote step size and I wrote initialization here. And these are the parts of teaching that I don't enjoy much because uh, every at, at the latest, every two years, if not ev if not each year, um, actually all of these answers change. <laughs> That's so annoying. <laughs> um, so it shows you that you know it's very much uh, still evolving. Yeah. So for uh, for step size, um, I mentioned Adam, which today is good, and actually already last year was good, and the year before. All right. Okay. Um, initialization also changes all of the time. Uh, for example, currently there is a paper which is called, well, actually, the paper has been around for a while, but it took a while before it got noticed. Uh, all you need is a good init. All you need is a good init. Uh, that, you know, as of today, would sound like a good strategy to initialize your neural network. Um, but overall, yeah, so before my answer has always been, well, if you need to adjust parameters or hyperparameters, well, you do cross-validation. Um, but here, you know, you only have a finite amount of training data and you only have a finite number of GPUs and uh, there's just no way, you know, is, is it, Especially you know, when I say architecture, it's not like you choose between A, B, and C, but but within A, you know, there are so many choices that you could be making. Yeah? So we have this problem overall. Uh, I've called this so many parameters, so little training data. And uh, let's say also lifetime, a number of GPUs. Okay, so that's a fundamental problem here. And uh, well, hence we can uh, do two things. Uh, we can decrease. Ah, not not decrease, but decrease. <laughs> uh, 
the effective number of parameters on the one hand. And here we can try and uh, make our training data bigger, augment training data. And I want to talk about this augmentation a little bit. Um, now, our our world has a you know a special a special structure. So, let's say we want to build a device uh, which recognizes if we have a smiling face. Now, let's say we want to discriminate all the smiling faces in the world from all the non-smiling, or more generally speaking, from all the other faces in the world. Uh, let's assume that we have uh, you know, not a lot of pre-processing. So um, uh, we, don't, we want to do everything with the network. We don't want to put before the network a face finder and face centering machine, etc. I just want to put it, dump it in the neural network. Sorry, my first face was here. And now, um, and with a frame, I try to indicate, you know, what, what does it mean to have a picture? Um, so these are two pictures, right? Um, it's actually the same face, it's just been displaced a little bit. Um, now, these faces are just points. Uh, if this picture has a million pixels, then each face is just a point in million dimensional space. Yeah? So this is face A, this is face B. I'm going to move this a little bit. I call this face A, I call this face B. And in the space of all images, you know, I have this point A and uh, I have this point B. And well, I could now say, all right, let's interpolate. And the simplest way to interpolate, of course, is in the space of all images to interpolate linearly. And then I could say that here, um, this is A plus B half. Now, what is this uh, going to look like? And maybe somebody who has never answered a question yet could answer for a change. Uh, it's not, a, not such an easy question, maybe. What would the average image here look like? I think you have answered questions before. So have you, and so have you. <laughs> Somebody who has never said anything. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the uh, the average face, uh, you know, we have this half. So I'm making this here in let's say in gray. Uh, the average face between the two looks like this. <coughs> so this is a plus b half here. But if you had, or if you had asked me, you know, to interpolate between the left image and the right image, I guess what we all wanted was the face which was nicely centered in the in the image. Yeah. So, well, what does that mean? It means that as I translate my face in the space of all images, uh, actually this is uh, well, it's certainly a nonlinear curve. Yeah, because the linear curve we can sample by just superimposing those two images with varying fractions. So, in, in other words, uh, what to us is trivial, um, trivial uh, transformations of images, such as rotation or translation, etc. Um, follow non-trivial trajectories
in the space of all images. Yeah, so up here we had the images, and down there we had the space of all images. So if I now want to build a classifier which says, all right, this was a smiling face, and that was a smiling face, but I want my neural network to also you know, the, uh, assign the label smiling face to the intermediate spatial shifts, then I want, that means I want my neural network to understand that actually all of these things here are smiling faces. Note that it's really the same face. Yeah? Let's say it's the same Mona Lisa or something. It's just that she was shifted a little bit to the right or to the left. Well, and data augmentation means that, for example, given just, these, given just the image A, I generate all of these other images along this trajectory just by shifting it a little bit. Or now we could say, um, well, I also want my, uh, let's see, can I rotate by five degrees here? I don't think so. Rotate. Mm. Okay, 45 degrees is a lot. But if I want to recognize even this is a smiling face. Yeah. So uh, I started from face A. But I've now rotated a little bit. So uh, I got the in image space, you know, maybe this was this point here. And now as I rotate it back to A, this follows another complicated trajectory. Or I could rotate it in the other direction. It looks like this. Well, now this rotation, I can, of course, do that for all intermediate points on my trajectory also. So all the intermediate points, I can also uh, rotate a little bit to the left or rotate a little bit to the right. And I always keep the label that, but yes, this is a smiling face. Yeah? So I always uh, give this the same label. And so in some sense, I can artificially inflate my database of examples by applying transformations that I want my system to be invariant against. Or if I want my system to be equivariant with a certain change, then I can also use that. So um, maybe, um, actually, I want to train a system that finds out, uh, you know, let's say if I want to build a marching robot, uh, uh, you know, a robot that, that's not falling over with two legs, um, then to find out if the robot is still upright. I can, of course, uh, build in uh, you know, uh, a sensor that, that tells me. But the sensor might fail, or it might not be so accurate, or I might want another source of information. So it would be quite useful for the robot um, to also use its uh, vision to see uh, you know, if, if the world looks uh, upright or not. And actually, this is something that we use a lot ourselves. Um, Standing on one leg with your eyes closed for a longer amount of time is actually not so easy because we, especially if you fail to drink, because we use that a lot ourselves. Um, now, if I want to generate the training data, yeah, I would have some images which are carefully calibrated. That yes, you know, the camera took this image and was upright. And well, then I can take the same images and rotate by 10 degrees and, and attach a label. Okay, this uh, corresponds to. Uh, an angle of or deviation from the horizon of 10 degrees, etc. And, and so I can, I still need a large training set because I want my robot to be able to figure out where, where it's up and where it's down in all kinds of environments. So I would still need many pictures from different environments, but all of them I could um, you know, artificially rotate a little bit and also thus create the labels that, that I need. So that would be an example of an equivariant system where as I change the input, I want to change my output, let's say an estimated angle, uh, correspondingly, what I've given here was an example where I want invariance. I just want to recognize this is a smiling face no matter whether it's upside down 
or not. Yeah? So I want to know is the person happy, no matter whether the person is standing on her hands or not. Good. Yeah. So this is um, this entire thing is uh, something called a data augmentation. So we're on the right hand side. Huh? We have two little training data. We want to augment the amount of training data. And this is called data augmentation. What is data augmentation? Um, it means that we obtain new inputs and perhaps new labels, depending on the task. I'm manipulating or distorting, uh, etc., the trading data. All right. So we have seen that standard training of a neural network is by means of gradient descent. That in order to do the gradient descent, we need to find the derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameters. That this gradient is found because we have a nested set of functions, uh, is found by chain rule. If we're also re reusing computations, then we preferably use reverse mode algorithmic differentiation, which is an instantiation of dynamic programming. Uh, and that allows us to mechanically uh, find whatever uh, gradients we need. And in the end, I try to highlight the many, many choices that we need to make, which is part of the problem of neural networks. And uh, we will look next time at strategies to reduce the number of parameters. Today we started by discussing data augmentation as a means to artificially increase the training data when you have too little to fix all of those parameters, uh, just purely by uh, cross-validation or similar tools. Thank you very much, and see you on Wednesday.